Right to be read podcast episode number 115 interview with Jim Haskett. You are listening to the Right to be read podcast and this is your host Ani Alexander. Hello everyone and welcome to the Right to be read podcast, the podcast that inspires and encourages writers. I'm your host Dani Alexander and first of all before we start today's episode, I would like to apologize. For the first time in more than one year, I skipped posting not even one but three podcast episodes and uh, I just want to let you know that no I'm still alive I'm still around and I'm still uh, thinking about continuing this podcast um, the thing is life came into way I had a uh, serious family issues and It was difficult to get back on track, so I had to skip those two weeks when I wasn't around and the podcast didn't come out. So first of all, apologies for that. I'm not sure you even noticed, but in case you did and in case you missed those, thank you very much. So um, I hope it won't happen again. I will stick to my regular schedule and you will keep getting your encouragement and inspiration on a regular basis. So uh, before we start also, I would like to announce a really nice thing that we created with Jasna Ramachandran, who, if you haven't heard so, is my business partner. With Jasna, we launched a online business which is a publishing services for writers but with exclusive twist because what we do is we publish your books under your name and you keep 100% of your royalties and you keep all the rights for your book so all we do is we help you with publishing your book we do everything that needs to be done you just provide us with your draft manuscript we do everything in maximum two weeks and you have the book out there under your name we don't touch your royalties it's yours it's just out there in the world for readers to buy and read and within our business uh, we decided that you know we have to start by giving something out and what we are giving out right now is we have created a giveaway just today a few hours ago i prepared this and the giveaway is a professional kindle cover for your book so our designers from our team will create exclusively a kindle professional cover for your book and why we decided this was because we do believe that people do judge the book by its cover and if you have heard our interviews with the writers before you can see that most of the writers do agree with this and they say how important the book cover is and why it's so important is that the book cover design is one of the most important elements for sales and all of us would like to to get sales for our books right so if you are just publishing a book or need a new cover for the book you have already published then this giveaway is for you so check it out at www.annialexander.com backward slash cover and you'll get all the details so it's very simple and uh, we will be having three winners so check it out and uh, I hope you like the sample covers which we have as illustration and I hope that you will benefit from our offer and now let's start finally the episode and today I have yet another interview and let's just start okay today we have uh, Jim Haskett over he's a writer he's a podcaster he's a world traveler as well I guess we'll we'll talk about that too to see where he's been so uh, Jim thank you very much for coming over and um, thanks for uh, listening to my podcast because I know that you've heard at least a few episodes right Yes, absolutely. Hi, Ani. Thanks for having me on your show. 
Thank you. Okay, so let's start um, from the very beginning. I mean, I really uh, love talking to fiction writers because it's something that kind of, you know, I, I realize that nonfiction writers most often come across their book ideas um, depending on what they are doing in their everyday life and they link it to their business and, you know, speaking topics and stuff like that. With fiction, it's a bit different. So can can we kind of, you know, try to understand how did you end up writing fiction and how did you chose your genre, what type of books you're going to write? Well, I've always loved fiction ever since I was uh, very little, reading Roald Dahl and C.S. Lewis, The Chronicles of Narnia. And then when I was a little bit older, I discovered Stephen King was probably the first author that I fell in love with. Uh, I really loved his ability to terrify me as a young as a young teenager, <laughs> now that I'm, his books don't really terrify me anymore, but I still enjoy them. But I, I can remember the profound impact his books had when I was young and that not being able to read some of them after dark because they were so scary. And <laughs> it's, it's pretty profound when an author can have that kind of impact on you. Oh, yeah. Okay, so so you basically, your journey as a writer, we can say that started from the very beginning when you actually enjoyed reading fiction in your teenage years. Yeah, and I started off writing some short stories at that time, you know, basically horror because I was just trying to write like Stephen King. Uh -huh. So that was probably my first attempt at writing when I was a teenager. And then I, I didn't write for a long time for most of my 20s because I was pursuing a regular job and it really just because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life till I rediscovered writing again later. Okay, so can we find out like what happened? How did you rediscover it and how one actually decides that he wants to become a writer? I had an idea for a story that I had um, been kicking around and thinking about for many years and I had a, I had a roommate who he was a writer And he wanted to become a Hollywood screenwriter. Uh -huh. And so we were talking about different story ideas. And I told him my idea. And he said, we should write that. So we sat down and we spent a few months writing out a screenplay. And then we wrote another screenplay together. And we obviously didn't get those produced. Um, because getting into Hollywood is terribly difficult. Uh, but... So writing those screenplays with him, I think, gave me the confidence that I could write something on my own. Uh -huh. Whereas I don't, I don't think that I had that level of confidence before. So I wrote a screenplay on my own. I wrote actually two screenplays and I entered them in some contests and I did well, but I didn't catch the interest of anyone in Hollywood. And sort of at that point, I realized that I wasn't sure if screenwriting was what I really wanted to do anyway because I didn't want to move to Los Angeles and I didn't really want to get caught up in that um, Hollywood machine. Mm -hmm. So I realized that what I really loved doing was telling stories, not necessarily screenplays. So I took that, that first screenplay that I wrote on my own and I uh, rewrote it as a novel. And that was really when I fell in love with novel writing. And before that, I just hadn't known what I wanted to do. And you asked how I decide that I wanted to be a writer. Well, I don't know if there's if I can do anything else. I feel like I'm a writer because that's what I have to do. Uh huh. Okay. So you feel the urge and you you feel the need for writing, and no matter what you will be doing, you you would be writing anyway, right? Yeah, I don't know if I could be satisfied in any other uh, life pursuit after after having written now, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah, I see. Well, you mentioned that you wrote those uh, very first screenplays together with someone. So uh, what's the difference between writing with someone and writing alone? I mean, what, what are kind of, you know, are, are there any differences or, you know, any difficulties in terms of writing with someone else? Well, when I'm writing alone, I don't have to make any compromises. <laughs> That's one nice thing about it. But there was there was a lot to like about the collaborative process because I can remember many an afternoon when my screenwriting partner, Chris, and I would be trying to figure out what was going to happen in a certain scene. 
and I would have one vision and he would have another vision and the two would conflict. And so we would spend a good amount of time just sort of angrily staring at the computer screen, not knowing (laughs) what to do next. And then usually what would happen is we would come up with a third alternative that was different from uh, either of the ones that we'd come up with. And it was usually better. So the collaborative process, what I've seen is it's very painful, but it can often have really great results. Okay, I see. Okay, so let's just, you know, um, continue with your journey. So you you wrote uh, the screenplays with someone. Uh, later on, you, you wrote some alone. Uh, later on, you kind of, you know, modified one of those into a novel. You realized that you that's what you want to do from now on. And what happened? Because, I mean, most of the writers who kind of dream becoming writers and pursuing that career and doing it full time usually are caught up with different life circumstances and end up, you know, f- one way or another kind of uh, working somewhere else and then writing on their spare time. So what was your case? What happened with you? Well, during the course when I was writing that first novel, I did have a day job. Uh, I was working for a technology company here in the U.S. And so I was just writing in my spare time. And it took me, I think, two years to write that first novel. And I, I could have probably written it a lot quicker, but I was endlessly revising it because I didn't know any better. I wrote probably a dozen drafts of that novel in the first two years, which if I could do it again, I would have maybe spent six months writing it and then put it aside and started the next thing. Because Mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's only a certain, you can only edit a novel to a certain point. So after I finished that novel, I was at that time interested in pursuing traditional publishing and I really wanted to get an agent and then find a publisher. Um, so I sent out a lot of query letters. Yeah, I did a lot of research and read books on how to write query letters. And I spent a lot of time on the absolute right forums, learning how to write query letters. Mm. And I couldn't interest an agent in that book, I think because it wasn't very good. You know, it was my first attempt at writing a novel and it had a lot of problems. So I spent maybe six months querying that book and then I set it aside and wrote a second novel which was very different. That first novel was kind of a thriller and the second novel was a lot more contemplative. It was a lot more thoughtful. It was about a a guy who's putting his life back together uh, while there's a parallel story about a woman whose life is falling apart and then their lives intersect. And it was not very interesting. (laughs) And I, and I wasn't able to get an agent for that book either. Uh, And at that time, so I, you know, the, my first and second novels were in different genres because I wasn't really sure what genre I wanted to write in, partly because I think at that time, even though I had had a great love of reading when I was younger, I hadn't read all that much in the last few years, um, proceeding up to starting to write. And I think, you know, that's, it's pretty well-worn advice at this point that if you want to, um, if you want to write, you should read widely, you know, read in many different genres. And that, that helps you discover what genre you want to write in. But once I started writing, I started reading a lot more, reading different genres. Um, and I, especially like now I like, I read a lot of fantasy and sci-fi, even though I know I have no interest in writing in those genres, but I still enjoy them. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, and how do I mean, I see that you have already many, many books on Amazon and, you know, you, you've written quite many books already. So um, are, are those series? Are you writing series? Two of the properties that I have on Amazon are series. Um, I only actually at this point have one full length novel available on Amazon. And that was the third novel that I wrote. That's called Reagan's Ashes. And I had originally written that book with the intention of pursuing traditional publishing, still trying to get an agent. But at some point um, during the process of writing it, I started to think that maybe self-publishing, becoming an independent author might be a more uh, valid goal because it was, you know, when I started writing, it was maybe 2010, 2009. 
And at that time, there was still a lot of stigma attached to being oh, a yeah. self-published author. I mean, the idea was if you were self-published, it was because you couldn't make it. Yeah. But as I was writing more, I started to hear stories about people like Hugh Howey and Barbara Freethy and Andy Weir and these people who were self-publishing and being successful and more and more people who were choosing to self-publish because they were starting to see the traditional publishing industry as archaic and you know the, the wave of the past, whereas being an indie author was the wave of the future. So I put out that first novel um, – well, actually, that wasn't the first thing I put out. So you were asking me about series. I have a series called The Five Sun Saga, which is a mixture of uh, dystopian and political espionage. Mm-hmm. And that I wrote as a, a collection of short stories and novellas. And so I started putting those out at the end of last year. And I think I, I just, the last book in that series is coming out in August of 2015. And so I think I'm done with that. My other series is called the Whistleblower series. And it's currently a trilogy, but I think there, there may be a fourth book there. I'm not entirely sure yet. And that's a more standard thriller. Uh, I seem to have trouble sticking to one genre because I do like to um, expand a bit. Like my Reagan's Ashes is a mystery the whistleblower trilogy is a straight up um, chase thriller, you know, danger from early on in the book. And then I also just put out a collection of humorous short stories. So I'm kind of all over the map. Okay, well, then I have a question for you, because I, uh, you know, I have the same problem sticking to one genre. And it seems that that kind of sort of complicates a bit in terms of, you know, finding, I mean, you, you end up kind of building new audiences with every new genre you get into somehow. So how how are you kind of juggling and trying to balance those? I mean, if you are writing in several different genres, what are you doing with your audiences? Are the same people reading all your books? Or if not, you know, how, how are you building up your readership for each genre? Well, I think that there are there are genre boundaries or territories that if you cross, you'll be in trouble. Like if you write romance and then you also write um, robot sci-fi, those are two those are two those two genres are so far apart. Or if you write erotica and children's books, those things are so far apart that you are going to turn off some readers. But I think everything that I write, if I, if I had to say that I had one particular genre, it would be suspense. And mm-hmm. even my humorous short stories, they still have a very um, high tension suspense element to them. Like I have written some stuff under a pen name that's in a very different genre that I wouldn't want associated with the Jim Heskett brand or label or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. But I think that as long as everything is within the same kind of area, that readers won't be turned off too much. Because, you know, there are many thrillers that have romantic elements. Yeah. You know, there are romance books that have um, exciting parts to them. There are funny books that, uh, that can appeal to children and to adults. You know, there seem to be certain boundaries. And I'm just trying to stay within that main boundary, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay, I see. So how do you, I mean, where do you get your book ideas? How do I mean, because I, I meet many people who kind of, you know, they write well, they enjoy writing, but they, they say that they can't come up with an idea big enough in order to make a whole novel out of it, or, or to write a whole series out of it. So uh, how, where do you get the inspiration? And uh, where do you get your creative ideas of your books? Well, I get the ideas from many different places, I think. A lot of, most everything I write has some sort of elements from my own life in it. Uh, and I think that helps a lot. Like with my uh, Whistleblower trilogy, the main character is uh, a man who's about to lose, he's about to be laid off from his job or made redundant, you know, depending on where you are in the world. One of those phrases will make sense to you. <laughs> And he's about to be laid off from his job and his wife is six months pregnant. And when I started writing that series, that was exactly my scenario. Um, and but that book came from before I wrote that, I was a very strict plotter. 
Mm -hmm. And then I had this idea one night while I was out at a comedy club and the, the comedian on stage made a joke about turning water into wine. And the idea just came to me, what would you do if you were at a bar and you saw someone turn water into wine? Mm -hmm. And so that's where most of my ideas come from is just those sort of what if ideas or, or random things that interest me. Like my novel Reagan's Ashes is a lot of it is set in Rocky Mountain National Park, which is in Colorado where I live. And I like to, I like to hike in Rocky Mountain National Park a lot. I've hiked hundreds of miles of trails in that park. And so I knew that I wanted to set a book in that park, um, and then so I had the setting for the book and then I came up with a character. I came up with the, the, the protagonist is a young woman named Reagan. She's 24. Her father has just passed away and she's uh, suffering from mental illness. So I took that setting and that character and then the story just sort of blossomed from there. In that case, let's just, you know, uh, try to understand the other side of the story. What about self-discipline and productivity and stuff like that? How do you make sure that, uh, you know, you end up with so many books? Well, a lot of the stuff that one of the reasons why I, I published my first thing on Amazon in November of 2014, and I think I have 12 or 13 books up on Amazon now, I'm not really writing, you know, it's as we're recording this, it's July 2015, and so that's only been, what, eight months? And I'm, I'm not really writing that fast. <laughs> I'm not writing as fast as it would appear. A lot of that is stuff that, was, that I had been working on off and on for the last couple of years. My writing will definitely slow down now, um, now that I'm just about to release the last thing that I had in the bank. But I... I I really make it a priority to set aside some time for writing or something related to my author business every single day. Mm -hmm. I don't have any zero days. And one of the ways that I do that, it's, it's a challenge for me because I have a young son. My son is eight months old uh, and he requires a lot of attention. And I do, I don't have a day job, but I do some other things for money. I do some freelancing and some ghostwriting and some other things. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I do is there's an app that I use on my phone called Goal Streaks, and it uses Jerry Seinfeld's productivity method where you the, the Seinfeld productivity method is you, you get a calendar, and whatever your goal is, every day you make progress toward that goal, you put an X on that day. Mm -hmm. And then as you start to stack up Xs on consecutive days, you put a line through those Xs. And the idea is you just don't break the chain no matter what. You, know, you don't have a day where you don't get an X on it. So <clears throat> I'm currently at about 850 straight days of doing something for my author business. And maybe that's – it might be something as small as just taking a half an hour to write out a thousand words on a new project. It might be editing a couple of chapters from a project that's in revision. It might be – Something as simple as writing a newsletter um, that I'm getting ready to send out to my mailing list or making improvements to my website. Uh, it can be as simple as that, but I do something every single day and I don't let days stack up where I'm not doing something to further my author business. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to understand what happens uh, when uh, you finally decided that you want to self-publish and you're not pursuing traditional publishing route anymore, and you know you you put your very first book out there, and what happened? The first, I guess, the first thing I ever put out was a collection of poetry. <laughs> oh. I love poems, hate poems, and I I actually self-published that in 2011. And then I pulled it back down. I just wanted to see what it was like to go on to KDP and publish something. I just wanted to see what would happen. And I had it up for a few days and then I pulled it down because at that time, I think in 2011, there was still the idea that if you, um, if you self-publish something, a traditional agent would no longer be interested in you. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And that's, that itself has changed. I think even more these days that agents are proactively seeking out writers who self-publish and are successful. Yeah. Um, but then the second thing I published was a collection of short stories in November of 2014. And so I, I wrote it. I had it edited. Uh, I got a cover artist. 
And then I just put it up and used some of those KDP free days Mm -hmm. to generate some reviews. Uh, And then I just went back to work writing the next thing because I, I made it a priority to get my catalog up as quickly as possible. You know, I didn't want to have just one or two books sitting there on Amazon. I wanted to have a big catalog as quickly as possible. Okay, I see. So uh, I know that you're also doing some other things related to writing besides fiction writing. So what made you uh, go ahead and pursue other stuff as well? Like, you know, the podcasting and you also have a blog and things like that. So, uh, you know, are, are, are they things that are related to your author brand or there are things that you feel like you want to do as well on top of your writing or they are bringing you income or, you know, what, what's the reason? Well, the blo- I'll, I'll talk about the blogging first. I've been blogging for many years. I used to have a kind of popular review blog called The Harshest Critics You Know. And that was kind of hard to keep up. I wasn't making any money from it. And I don't think that if anyone is interested in blogging, they shouldn't be interested in it with the idea that they can make money. Uh, I think that was certainly possible five or six years ago that you might be able to create a blog with lots of SEO, lots of keywords stuffed into it. And you might be able to attract a lot of traffic. But I think, you know, based on the 80-20 rule, if you want really want to make money on blogging, you have to devote way too much time to it. And I'm much more focused on my fiction writing. So I do blog, but I mostly just blog because I like it. You know, I don't it's something that I don't spend a whole lot of time on. If I have thoughts on something, like with I had, you know, thoughts on the recent uh KDP Select, the Kindle Unlimited um uh rate change. Uh-huh. So I blogged about that because it was something that interested me and um, I don't expect to get a huge return on my time investment there with blogging, but it gets some clicks to my website and maybe if someone clicks on my website, they might click over onto my the books tab on my website and check those out. So I don't think that um, blogging is a great way for someone to spend their time if they're, if they're, if they're looking to reach the most amount of people quickly blogging is probably not the way to go. Probably actually a better way to do that, as you and I know, is podcasting. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And I I started a podcast called Indie Author Answers uh, earlier this year. And the reason I did that was I was, you know, I mentioned before, so I wrote two novels that I didn't publish. The first novel I published was actually my third novel. Mm -hmm. And I didn't publish those first two novels because I didn't think that they were good enough. Well, actually, the, the second novel I wrote, I'm currently rewriting. I kept the premise and I'm rewriting it with different characters in a different plot. But that first novel was really just sitting there in my digital trunk. You know, it was just sitting there in a folder on my hard drive and I wasn't doing anything with it. Mm-hmm. And I'd been wanting to create a podcast for a while, but I wanted to create a podcast that was different from most of the things that were out there because I think. If you really want to break through and reach people, you need to create a property that's that's a little bit different than what's already out there because you don't want to flood a market. So I, I initially, I was going to take my novel uh, and break it up into small chunks and put it on my blog and then offer on my blog critiques you know, because it was something that I wrote many years ago back when I wasn't uh, as skilled a writer as I am today, I was going to put it up on my blog and say, here are the storytelling mistakes that I made when I was writing it. Mm -hmm. But putting that all on my blog seemed like an enormous amount of work, you know, um, pasting in 2000 words of text and then going through and annotating it. It just seemed like it was going to take me hours and hours, you know, over the course of, Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the book is 97,000 words. And so I figured it would probably take me 200 hours to do all that. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about the return on, you know, the return on my time investment, would it really be worth it? And then, so I took that, that idea of critiquing my novel and creating a podcast and decided to put them together. So what I do, I split my novel into something like 70 chunks uh, of about 1,500 to 2,000 words each. And then each week, I do an episode each week, 
I on each episode I read that section of the book and then I go back through it and critique it the way a developmental editor would. I talk about point of view problems. I talk about sometimes grammar. I talk about um, storytelling cliches, just the kind of things that a beta reader or a developmenter, developmental editor would point out to someone. Mm-hmm. Okay, I see. So basically, you have sort of uh, even more audiences than I thought. So you, you basically have your readers who may, you know, vary a bit from book to book, depending on the genre, most probably. And you also have a completely different audience with your podcast, which are most probably, I can presume, that they are um, starting writers, right? Yeah, there it's it's geared toward writers and indie writers specifically, self-published writers specifically because I do talk about the self-publishing industry. But I think and one of the reasons why I wanted to do this was that I know a lot of writers who have blogs where they blog about writing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's great if you're a non-fiction author, like if you're uh if you're an author of books for writers, then blogging about writing, blogging with writing tips is a great way to attract new customers. Yeah. But if you write fiction, then blogging about writing itself, I don't think that's going to attract a whole lot of readers to your to your site, to your brand. So I thought that this might, while it does attract a lot of writers, I thought it might attract some readers too, people who would want to hear a bit of a story, you know, because they are getting to hear a whole novel read to them over the course of 70-something episodes. And they might also get to see behind the scenes of what it's like to to critique a novel, to take a novel that's that's got problems and to go back through and fix those problems. Let's get to the painful part of being a fiction writer. I mean... Okay. Marketing and selling fiction books seems to be harder... Uh, than nonfiction books. At least that's the impression I'm getting because there are many techniques and, you know, there are many things that nonfiction writers do which fiction writers can't and they are kind of leveraging it, linking it with their, you know, ongoing businesses and other things which, you know, which are the main income generation streams, not really the book itself. So here we have fiction writers, we have their books, and that's basically more or less what, I mean, the only thing they do. So basically, um, fiction writers depend more on, on book sales revenues, I guess. But at the same mm-hmm. time, it's, it's harder to sell fiction books. So um, what are your, like, you know, the best tips that worked for you best based on your experience? I think that... The best marketing you can do, and this is kind of a cliche to say this already, but the best marketing you can do is to write another book. Um, That's certainly true for someone who has one or two books out there. But once you start to develop a catalog, I think that it's important to do things like branch out into making audiobooks. I've been, so you can reach new people, you know, make sure that you have digital print and audiobook versions of all your books. And if only to make them more attractive to promotional sites like BookBub, for example, uh, they're much more likely to pick up your book if you have it in uh, ebook, print, and audio. Uh, but going back to your question, one of the great things I think about being an indie author is that I have the freedom to experiment. Um, and I really do enjoy. Uh, doing my own marketing for books. I think I used to think of marketing as very distasteful. You know, there's the cliche of the the writer up in her tower just writing and not oh, yeah. wanting to interact <laughs> with the public. And that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Uh, even with, the, with the invention of the internets, even introverts can reach out to people. Oh, yeah. Social media is wonderful for that. You know, I have uh, I I have a presence on basically every major social media outlet. Even though Facebook is my favorite, I'm not a big fan. I haven't been a big fan of Twitter, but I'm starting to warm up to it. Whereas I I've, I found so far that a lot of Twitter's a lot of just hashtags saying buy my book, and that kind of turns me off. But I think maybe. And I've said that before on other podcasts and stuff about bad mouthing Twitter, but maybe I'm just using it wrong. Um, but I, I like Facebook the best. I like interacting with people, and I've started experimenting with Facebook ads. I took Mark Dawson's 
oh, yeah. course. Um, and I've just started experimenting. I haven't invested a lot of money in it yet, partially because I haven't had the time. But I, I created um, an ad for signups to my mailing list, which was pretty successful. And I created an ad for one of my books. So I'm experimenting with copy and that kind of stuff there. One thing that's that's been pretty successful for me um, is using promotional sites like Kindle Nation Daily, um, Bargain Booksy, and those kind of things. I tried recently. I did a, um, a what do you call it? a countdown? I did oh, yeah. a KDP countdown for my novel Reagan's Ashes, where I discounted it from three ninety nine to ninety nine cents, and I had planned this months in advance. So what I did, I knew it was going to be on sale on Amazon.com and AmazonCo.uk for seven days. So I lined up some promotions where on the first day I had a promotion with um, Fussy Librarian. On the second day it was Bargain Booksy. On the third day it was E-Reader News Today. And then on the fourth day it was um, Midlist. And so I'd stacked all these promotions and that was very successful. You know, I made my, uh, I made my money back within a couple hours on the first day. And then, you know, as, as Amazon rewards, uh, Amazon rewards sales. Mm-hmm. So as my book was starting to sell more, I was seeing it in more lists like, you know, the hot list, whatever it is on Amazon. Oh, yeah. And so because I'd stacked those promos, my sales just kept climbing every day. And I actually, that was a very successful promo for me. Okay, I see. Well, for for all those who have listened to Mark Dawson's interview on our podcast, basically, yes, um, what what he was saying and what he's teaching on his course actually works. <laughs> okay, so basically, what about does it is it only a matter of time or also of several things done right in terms of building and growing your audience and keeping it there what, what are your i mean are, are you relying on your email list or are you relying on your interaction with your readers on on social media or you know what are you using most in order to to keep that audience growing and engaged with you Well, I heard Hugh Howey say in an interview once that he thought the path to indie author success was to put out as many properties as you can. He said at least a dozen, and then you just let them sit there and one will take off. I know that he said that that, because that's what happened to him. Yeah. He had, he had stopped even checking his uh, KDP sales dashboard when wool started taking off for some reason completely unknown to anyone, wool just took off one day. Mm-hmm. And then he became, you know, an international bestseller. I think for me, what's been most successful is doing those promotions. You know, I try to, I try not to bother readers too much, you know, pestering them to buy my books. I do have an email list and I, whenever I release a new property, I'll email them and say, you know, here, this is out, or often I will email them a few weeks before and say, if you'd like to get it for free, before it comes out, you can have it for free today if you want, and then it'll come out in a few weeks. So, but I think the thing for me is, I don't, I don't know if I can say that I've made it as an author. I'm still not making most of my income. I still make mo- the majority of my income from other sources, But whether I make uh, you know, 5% of my income or 100% of my income from writing, I'm still going to do it because I love it. And this is what I feel like I have to do. It's my goal to, to get 100% of my income just from my fiction writing. But it would be okay with me if that didn't happen. I don't know if you saw that, um, that uh, video that PewDiePie posted recently after it came out that he makes $7 million a year from YouTube videos. And he posted a video that he said, you know, I, I would do this even if I made no money because I love it. And it's just a it's just a, a happy accident that I make all this money doing what I love. And that's kind of how I feel. You know, I, I'm doing what I love. And on one hand, it it doesn't matter how much money I make from it. I'm just going to keep doing it until I can't do it anymore for whatever reason. Okay, I see. Well, and in order to wrap it up, um, just let's... Um 
talk about uh, since you know I have a feeling that many newbie writers are listening to us uh, let's just talk about y- you said that writing with someone kind of brought that encouragement and and the confidence you you lacked in the very beginning so if uh, you know we are in a stage when we have writer stops and we're not really sure if we're good enough or if we can write well or you know if it's good enough to put out there and you know many many different things that kind of keep many writers away from actually you know become uh, becoming authors what would be your advice to them my advice would be if you don't think you can write well write bad and that's okay just keep writing because Um, I don't believe that people are born with a writing gift. I think it's something that most people can develop if they, it's like a muscle. You just need to train it. And whatever you're writing now, when you finish it, the next thing is going to be better. Uh Okay. I see. So work out your writing muscle, guys. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming over. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. I, you know, I most probably have to check out your books because I have to be honest, I haven't read any of those. That's so. okay. Most people in the world have not read my books, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'll definitely check it out because now, you know, it's it's interesting. It's I always kind of go back and, and go through the books of authors I've spoken to because it always makes more sense, you know, and you get curious about what they actually write. Right. Okay, so... Well, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, it seems like that's it for today. You will be having more interviews with fiction writers in the future because I've decided to keep the balance and have more fiction authors over because we didn't have them enough yet. So uh, we'll be getting more fiction writers in the future. As to now, please don't forget to sign up for the giveaway. We're giving out three professionally designed kindle covers for your book so sign up to the giveaway at annialexander.com backward slash cover and i hope that you will become one of the three winners well thank you very much for listening Uh, if you have a minute please leave a review for the podcast on itunes and i'll meet you again and i hope i won't get lost for such a long time anymore. Take care, keep writing, and thanks once more.